But in terms of what HE is absolutely here to do, we're here for the people and we're here actually to improve outcomes for patients. And in order to do that, it's crucial that we recruit the people with the right values, skills and behaviours at the right time and in the right place. And that actually sounds probably more simple than it is in reality. But to enable the right people to come into our NHS and look after them in the way that we want, it's really important that we test for values, that we actually plan how we recruit, how we retain staff and how we invest in them in the future. And I think in particular for nursing and actually the rest of the health service, we've had the Francis report and we've seen actually where things do go wrong and, uh, and cultures that aren't appropriate and skill mixes that aren't right and education and training that's clearly questionable. And that's something we can never forget as we move forward. One of the biggest challenges as well, I think, that we can't underestimate, and Jan, you might speak about this later from the Let Be perspective, is actually how we work across health and social care and public health and ensure that we, we work across a seamless service and that actually we don't just operate within silos. And funding flows have never been that way and actually ways of working have never operated like that before. So there's lots of work to do in order to join the system together. And I think one of the greatest strengths of Health Education England is without a doubt its local education and training boards because they're the people that are engaging with the providers of the service. They're the people that are actually talking and listening and hearing the voices from patients, the public, the students, looking at this, the data from patient experience to staff satisfaction. And it's only through the success of the Let Bees where we actually have a chance to really make improved outcomes for patients and get those right staff in the right places with the right values at the right time. A little bit about our local education training boards. We've got 13 across England, and the, the diagram um, presents that. But what's really important, again, and I will emphasise that it's about local leadership, and it's actually about ensuring that they're provider-driven, so the let bees are listening to what the provider's needs are, what the provider's workforce plans and demographics look like, and actually understand the challenges that the that service providers face in trying to deliver high-quality care to its community. And um, again, I think, you know, Jan, you might talk about this, but I think there's been lots of early successes. We authorised 13 of the Let Bees, all of them, last year, and we saw some great examples of actually provider chief execs from different patches coming together to talk to each other, recognising the similarities, and really putting the lens on education and training and not seeing it as something that comes second or third down the line. We've recently had the publication of our mandate and this has been a very interesting tale because when, education, when Health Education England and the new infrastructure was thought through, it wasn't quite sure, well, what will the commissioning board do? Do you remember having those questions? What's Public Health England? What will Health Education England do? And it was all quite up in the ether because I guess most will remember that that sort of work was subsumed within 10 strategic health authorities. <coughs> So that's now been completely fragmented and where things sat quite easily within one place, within one region, it's now been dispersed across a number of organisations. So NHS England, they published their mandate back in November last year, I don't know those of you that have seen it, but really important for us all to understand because if we're to get the education and training right of our workforce, we need to understand the commissioning intent. And back to some of the real challenges, how long have we talked about shifting care from secondary to primary settings? How long have we talked to, about integrating health and social care? I remember the centre opening, you know, Centre of Health and Social Care Improvement opening here in ways of trying to bring the two together. But actually, I think often we've, we've sort of not done it as much as we could and what we certainly haven't done is identified the metrics behind that. So if we are shifting care from secondary to primary, for example, well, how many beds then are there more in the community or where's the workforce shift that we can evidence to demonstrate that change? So in a way of trying to unpick that, um, we've had the NHS England mandate which talks about outcomes for patients and how they want to move forward with the clinical commissioning groups in terms of what the services they commission. And we've had our mandate which really gives our intent as to what they want the £5 billion that we've been allocated to be spent on. So you won't see any surprises in there in terms of it's about delivering excellent health care 
and health improvement and that's really key we're being challenged and will be challenged how then is your education improving patient outcomes what are you doing different if you're brilliant at interprofessional learning show me what difference that makes in practice because if it doesn't then why are we doing it so there's lots of that work that's going on I think the other thing that's really clear about the mandate is it really exposes, and I think it's quite rightly so, um, the transparency agenda. So just where and how the funding is spent and what it will be spent on. And I think that's a very powerful, powerful message for the professions moving forward. Because I think we've probably have all felt at one time or another, and I've got medical friends and they would say this too, that you know, medics had a big chunk of the cake really, and others had less. Some of that's legitimate, because actually they're part of the workforce, they fund their own degree, whereas nurses and AHPs in certain areas don't. But in other areas, I think their CPD fundings and their revalidation needs have been probably met earlier than some of the other professions. Something that's really challenging to, for us to do as well is actually how we hold the NHS account and, and how there becomes that real clarity as to what who is doing what and where is doing what. So in an ideal world, it is quite right that the commissions of service should lead to how we educate and train our workforce. But are they the experts within the field? Or actually, is it the people within this room? Is it a mix of people across the different services that can actually really identify how we get the right workforce moving forward? And I think that's going to be a continued journey back and forth over the next coming years. And a real example of that, I think, of probably not getting it provider-driven, is the health visiting target that we've been um, required to deliver. So by um, 2015, we're required, and this is in the old world, but we're still stuck with it, 4,200 additional new health visitors across the system. Now, is there a service need for that? What do we do with that workforce? Do we really need to put that many people at the 0 to 5 age bracket or actually do we need more at the 50 to 90 age bracket and probably beyond and that again is where the let bees and and listening to our providers is so crucial because i'm not sure providers where are you i can see so would you think you'd need 4200 health visitors across england would that have been something on the forefront of your mind probably not so um so i think you'll see a lot more of that as we move forward In terms of some of the deliverables, so it's, again, this is very different for education training. No more can it hide within deanery worlds. We're being required to report to the ministers and, and be held to account for our money. We've got 38 short-term deliverables, which you'll see trotting along, I think, quite quickly over the coming year, and 18 longer terms one. And as you can see, workforce planning education is central to it, and we need to tackle the historical issues. And these are really shocking examples, I think. 20,000 oversupply of consultants by 2020. That's the anticipated, well, how we've got the wrong from supply and demand, got it wrong. Um, and we spend 70,000 to train a qualified nurse and 560,000 to train a medical consultant. And I won't bore you with all the details, but I think you can just see the, the challenge that we're faced with. How do we get the fairness, the parity, and the right mix of people in order to deliver the quality of care that we all want to do so? And really interesting stuff happening around emergency medicine. So what could be the role of the paramedic in the future compared to the role of it today? Could there be significant players in preventing us having the blockage at, at A&Es and in emergency departments? So we need to think outside the box. And, I think educators are in a real ideal position to think about how can we educate people in such a way that enables them to be flexible and most importantly responsive to the patient needs. We've got a strategic intent document that uh, came out in February this year and again it's available online and I can make that, that available to you after. But what that's about is beginning the conversation because probably I don't know what you're thinking, but as I'm talking about it, when I joined Health Education England last September, where do you start? You know, we know we've got this, sounds really big pot of money, but actually most of it is taken up on training and posts. 
And we've also got real pressing issues such as dementia, such as emergency care, such as 24-7. So please have a read of the strategic intent and there's an opportunity for you to comment on it. Um, and we're actually going to be bringing it out back in the autumn, refreshed based on what people have said. But again, back to the importance of being provider-driven. We need to hear you, we need you to tell us, and then we can forge forward together. So very important that we get that, that, that voice. In terms of some of our strategic priorities, and some have been thrown at us and some have been probably a bit more gifted to us, um, I've had the joy of cutting my teeth on the pre-degree care experience, which uh, probably some of you know or not know about. But the more I look into that piece of work, and we've got our second national steering group tomorrow, I think the more interesting it is because we do not understand attrition really well. We don't really understand, nationally this is, when people leave, why they leave, is it them, is it the programmes, is it the mentorship, have they got the wrong values, is it good to have experience before you start or actually does that tarnish you and indeed goodness, it should never tarnish you to have experience before you surely you start but that is very much not only within the published literature but with also within what people tell you. Yesterday I was at Greenwich University and I were meeting some students and as, uh, as Linda said, you know, I've worked here, I've recruited lots of students, enjoyed it very much as part of the role. And I don't think, I can honestly say I never thought, I'm not sure about that one, but we need to have the, that number. I ne can never think any of us that were recruited with thinking that. And yet I said to these students yesterday, so do you think we've got it right then? They went, no, I think there's people in here that should never be in here. Now, what does that mean? You know, so it will be interesting in terms of understanding this pre-degree care experience. Before, um, you know, sometimes people get quite cross at me because I've been given this to lead on, but we must remember that this initiative came out of Francis as a minimum of three months experience. And actually, it was about trying to tackle some of those massive challenges that we found in that report. And I do sort of think we sometimes lose that sight. And that report was developed with nursing advice and uh, research evidence, all the rest of it. So it would be interesting one to keep your eye on as we progress with it. The other thing that's really interesting at the moment, and I work closely with my um, medical director, Wendy Reid, is the notion of four-year GP training. So the GPs think, well, actually, I don't think three years is enough. We need an extra year. Never mind, it might cost millions to do that. And we're challenging that, and we have to come up with a model that actually works and is viable. We're also really keen about, and uh, I, I always say this, and I must stop it, we must find another name, is the Bands 1 to 4, but basically our support workforce. I think they're hugely underinvested. I think they're part of probably the problem and the solution. Um, again, you know, out and about, asked a patient, do you know what that person is? It's a nurse, isn't it? No, actually, it's a support worker. Our uniforms aren't correct. We don't have confidence about the training across the piece. And actually, where is the progression routes for some of them? Some places do it really well. And actually, in other areas, they're, they're completely stuck within a trap that's really difficult for them to either flourish as a healthcare support worker and have lots of pride in what they do and or progress into something different. So there's work around that going on. We've talked a lot about values-based recruitment and I, I think I need not say much more other than I think this time next year, if not before, we will all be clear at every university across England that there will be a values test for anybody that's considering going into the caring professions and we're working hard to say what does that look like, can we do it once or do we need to do it 13 times, is there more than one way and that work has been taken up, um, up as we speak. The other area is dementia awareness and that's a real big thing about health and social care and I think um, real challenges to patient safety within organisations because I'm not convinced that within the curricula and within what we teach, what we induct, what we mandate in terms of education training, that people are clear about what are the signs of somebody that's possibly suffering with dementia, what are the symptoms and actually what can you do to alleviate and care for them really carefully and sensitively. So I think this is a real opportunity as well to um, look at how the profession connects with people. Because when I've been to dementia units and I see it brilliantly, 
actually that connectivity between the skills and the communication and the compassion and care of the practitioner and or assistant compared to um, somebody that hasn't had that training I think is quite it's quite powerful to watch and Cheryl I know you've got an excellent unit within Wolverhampton that's done a lot of work around how you change the environment and how you connect with people in different ways and I think that's that's exciting moving forward. We're also looking to improve feedback for trainees and students and Ian Cumming will say he wants every board to consider what patient, what patient experience is saying alongside student experience and I would go one step further really and say what about trainer mentor experience what do we know about what they feel or what they don't feel or whether they should or whether they could do the job I think in nursing it's very much assumed that you'll be a mentor whether you want to or like it or not is probably a different issue so I think more information and understanding of those learners experience in practice will be interesting moving forward some other stuff we've got there are We've talked about wine and participation, but this was something that was thrown into the mandate. Non-surgical cosmetics. It was like, well, where did that come from? But we've got to look at how we can have some standards around people that have Botox and, uh, and all of those things. And I'm certainly not knocking it. And I'd be really keen to make sure that they're safe and people know what they're doing with that. Genomics. Ian Cumming is leading on that. And I think, watch this space on genomics, because... I think that's really going to, and Jen, actually, you're a significant part of that from the Let B and indeed got the um, Modernising Scientific Careers a plethora of stuff going on. But I think that, again, the more we understand our bodies, the more we understand our genetic makeup, what decisions will we make and what care will we want and actually how we treat people. So I think that could be quite a transforming moment. And then the other thing that um, we've talked about, and I think, again, you could be quite cross in the room about this, and it came out of Francis, was that we've got to develop a postgraduate um, nurse training programme for older people. And you just think, oh, you know, why older people? But, but we've got to unpick what that means. And actually, do you think we should have some kind of specialist training for those people over a certain age with more than two or three comorbidities? Um, actually, just give us a hand show on that. Who thinks that would be quite useful to have that kind of a programme? Or should... Yeah. Oh, well, that's reassuring. You'll be on the steering group. <laughs> <laughs> just some of our policy landscape, and I hope I've talked about this, and what I'm trying to articulate to you is that local priorities are key. We have also got government priorities, which are a pain, but, you know, we've got them and we've got to deliver on them. They're very important. They're our masters. And we've got the national priorities. And you know what? Trying to marry the two is just a nightmare. And, and I think, you know, we'll, we will have challenges over this for some time to come. And then the other thing, and I've talked a lot about it, but I really would like people to think about it. And, um, you know, how do we actually get the evidence base? And I would love to see some research and innovation in this area in terms of understanding our supply and our demand and the mix. And what I think we've done in the past is we've introduced a new role. So lots of band, lots of people have gone for band four roles, which are really specific, skilled up part of the workforce to do specific things. But what did that do to the band three or the band five or the ward sister? And I really would, um, really would like us to think about how can we crack this really difficult nut in that we can't just keep popping new roles up without thinking of what does that mean to the wider system and the wider workforce. And Jo Lenehan, our Director of Strategy and Workforce, is currently developed, um, it's going to be a call for information, it's going to go out to the system about what do you understand about your workforce and some kind of... Um, standards and ideas about what questions to ask and I think that would be interesting when we get that information back to see at local and national level what, what pictures are similar and what pictures are different because I think it's been quite a personal approach in terms of thinking about your supply and demand and actually people move about um, and I think we need more of a, a national local mix within that and of course today and tomorrow that uh, we must, we're always chasing tomorrow and the next thing and uh, I think sometimes our workforce plans reflect three, five, maybe even some instances, six or seven years ago. Just some of our funding and levers. Uh, we've talked about around four billion funding nationally, and that does sound an awful lot of money. But actually, um, a lot of that does go on medical trainees, and they are employers. So actually, there isn't that much that's left. Um, 
And what we really need to think about doing is how can we make the most of that? So getting the numbers right is crucial. We also need to think about how can we attract the right people into the profession. And again, you know, I know the video is quite moving, but if people really understood what they were going into, is it what they would want to do or not? And how much money could we save, sounded a bit callous here, if people said, oh, actually, I've had a look at that and it's not for me. And I think too often people go in and then bit down the line think, actually, it isn't for me. So there'd be a lot more work around NHS careers and making sure that we not only attract the right people, but we keep the right people. And there's a lot of work to do around CPD on that agenda. How do we keep people fresh and invigorated? And how do we get rid of the dross? So the CPD that doesn't do it, but people say, I went on the course and, yeah, I did it. We don't want that. We want them to come back saying, right, I'm ready for it now. And then just some things around um, ambition and innovation. Um, you know, we're still looking at a workforce model of the 80s when we look back, when we look at the national picture. It's still very much secondary focused, very medically dominated. And in some areas, we've tinkered around the edges or, you know, we've gone bonkers with the idea that we need loads of health businesses, but then what the hell do we do with them when we've got them? So we need to think about how that changes moving forward. We need to look at 24-7 working. So we know through the Bruce Keogh work and other reports that you're more likely to die in the, at the weekends than you are in the week because of the staff that are around in the facilities. How, can that, how dare we sort of almost say that, but that is common practice. We've got globalisation, and for the medics that's particularly challenging because lots of medics like to go overseas and do different things. And what does that mean to the investment we've put in in the early years? We've also got issues around curative and palliative care and long-term conditions, which I think we don't understand and we need to understand a lot more. We've talked about supporting a dementia-aware workforce, but an interesting one is the feminisation of the workforce. And, you know, many nurses and doctors decide they'll go into training and then have babies. Well, how dare they, really? <laughs> But in terms of this supply and demand methodology, which is why I'd love some more research and deep thinking around it, actually we need to put in the potential that people aren't going to be there and then they're going to come back and probably want different ways of working. And they're just some things that we've talked about, where we've gone in the past to actually where we want to go in the future. And uh, I think the notion of technology and apps and um, bedside and... You know, um, Ian Cummings talks about he goes to visit sometimes people in hospitals and he talks to them and their patients have got their iPad in their bed and they have their consultation and then the people are being challenged around, well, just read this, is that right or not? And that's, that's quite a different way of education training people to think their patients are going to be so receptive to information. And I think really that's probably all for me for about now, but look forward to taking any questions later unless anybody's got a burning issue that they want to ask now in the spirit of what Linda said at the beginning. <laughs> that's it. Thank you. Thank you.